Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell through the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. seated, please. I know this might be a bit of a stretch, but do you know who Jesus' disciples remind me of? The NFL replacement refs. Really, think about it. Here's a bunch of guys who mean well, but just can't seem to get it right. They supposedly know the game rules. But yet when push comes to shove, they trip over each other with all kinds of blown calls. Well, thank goodness the regular refs are back, but the damage still lingers. My condolences to all of you Packers fans. Well, sort of. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Earlier in Mark's Gospel, the disciples were also running around making bad calls, right? disputing among themselves this time the worst of all calls. In other words, who's the greatest of themselves? And Jesus runs along like any good coach, protesting from the sidelines. He calls a timeout, telling them, look guys, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Hardly what these replacement refs had in mind. And while they're still talking, John complains about a man outside their group who was casting out demons. This is a great little story. Again, they're complaining because here is a non-union exorcist. Have you ever thought about a non-union exorcist? A freelancer, if you will, who seems to be violating this mythical copyright on Jesus' name. And of course, they tell him to stop it since he wasn't a card-carrying member. John reports their censure of this illegitimate activity back to Jesus, no, looking, no doubt looking for a pat on the back or an attaboy. Good work. Jesus will have none of that. He doesn't go along with their cramped notion of grace. Instead, he says, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will soon be able thereafterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. There is no patent on grace. I like the way Martin Buber explained it. He wrote, Woe to the man so possessed that he thinks he possesses God. Jesus confronts this notion that divine activity is somehow confined to our proper channels. As disciples, he says, we belong to God. 
God does not belong to us. Likewise, we are called to serve, not to control. That's a hard message. The disciples assumed that to be in Jesus' company, to be authentically one of his flock, that meant you literally had to walk with him, listen to him, be in his presence, and then imitate him. This guy was not doing those things. The man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name may not have been a certified disciple. And yet, as Jesus points out, he had faith in Jesus' power to do good works. It's really interesting to note that just prior to this event, the disciples themselves had been unable to cast out a particular demon. And so then, by comparison, what business did this non-follower have doing their work and, in fact, being successful where they were not? You see the competitive nature going on here. Now, in any religious group or denomination today, there can be all kinds of pride of identity, which is guarded and preserved at all costs. We bump into this all the time. And in the midst of increasing religious pluralism, the instinct to protect one's beliefs can become even stronger, even to the point of prejudice. And the danger of prejudice is that our identity becomes distorted. It becomes introverted. And finally, it becomes exclusive. Existing in and of ourselves, we become our own complete universe, our little club with which we are very pleased, thank you. When that begins to happen, we quickly lose sight of the church's mission to the world altogether. I think in many ways this is an extremely difficult text to read and interpret because while Mark warns us here of the clear dangers of what I would call religious arrogance, we're also urged to exercise religious tolerance. But the difficulty, I think, always comes in drawing a line between what we will tolerate and what we will not, both in ourselves and in others. Again, most of us have no trouble affirming the ministry of those who think and act as we do. Why would we have a problem with that? We welcome such people in the arms of ecumenism. But the folks by whom we feel threatened or even insulted, those who openly denounce our faith, perspectives, and actions are a whole other story. And so, like the disciple John, we may have questions about the legitimacy of such people and their thoughts, their actions. We may even wonder whether they belong in the flock of Christ at all. I'm reminded of a Baptist layperson from my hometown back in Minnesota. And whenever I read this text, I think of Warren. Now, Warren was a quiet person, an unassuming man, you would think, if you didn't know him. And he operated an auto body shop at the end of Main Street. Warren really was an introvert in many ways, but he rarely intermingled with the other farmers and business persons who would gather at the two cafes, as we call them, on Main Street. We had the Maple Cafe and the Home Cafe. Sounds like small town America, doesn't it? And uh, he pretty much stuck to himself. He did not mingle. People knew who he was, but they didn't really know Warren. I would go down there every once in a while because my dad needed something fixed by Warren. And, you know, while your dad and the proprietor are doing their stuff, you know, when you're a kid, you just kind of wander around. You want to look at everything and touch everything, right? And Warren's shop, like I said, was a typical body shop except for one thing. He had this rack outside his office, and it was full of fundamentalist religious tracts. We didn't have those in our church. I'd never seen anything like this before, so I grabbed a whole bunch of them and took them home for reading. These were the kind of tracts that declared you were going to hell unless you repented on the spot. Maybe you've seen those around. And of course, the chief motivator of those publications is always guilt and fear. Never a word of God's love and grace. Now, Warren was mostly known, not for that, but for his weekly newspaper article where he published an ongoing crusade for years and years and years against Lutherans. How could people do such a thing to us? Well, 
it wasn't just Lutherans. Every once in a while, I would say maybe once every six months, he attacked the Catholics too. You know, just to stay limber. But as a kid, I ignored those weekly rants. And I think most people did. They just ignored them. You saw, oh, there's Warren's old rant. Let's move on. But then as I moved through college and seminary, I paid a lot closer attention because all of a sudden I began to think theologically. And I was curious to see what kind of theological, biblical distortions Warren would come up with next. During the last few years of his life, the majority of Warren's comments, and I'm, I, I'm not exaggerating, they were scathing, judgmental accusations against us. And I quote here, he claimed that Lutherans put greater trust in the right of confirmation than in the blood of Jesus. And we were also condemned for conducting what he said, and I quote here, false baptisms by sprinkling, because again, they believed in immersion, and approaching the Lord's table under false pretenses. Every week was the same old accusation. And not only did he imply that we were all going to hell, but he even fancied himself a scholar of Lutheran theology. Can you believe that? His closing statement at the end of each article was always this. Three words. Repent or burn. It has such a nice warm tone to it, don't you think? Especially the burning part. And even the other Baptists were utterly embarrassed about Warren. They didn't even want to talk about him. The question for me is, how do we come to terms then with individuals who point the finger of arrogance by calling what he considered us outsiders, calling us phonies? How are we to deal, like the disciples are trying to deal in this text today, how are we to deal then with those who act in Christ's name and yet do so from a position of intolerance. And even more important than that, how do we avoid committing the exact same attitudes and actions? I think one place we can make a difference in our culture today, and this is very practical, is by thinking twice before we forward certain inflammatory emails that show up in our inbox. And specifically, so many of these emails serve only to perpetuate the prejudice embedded in our culture's passion for intolerance. Think about it. Every time we hit that, that forward button, like Warren, we are becoming publishers of prejudice. Be careful what you forward to your friends and family. All of this, I think, brings us back to the disciples' original question, how do we know if someone is acting on behalf of Christ and the church? And I think Paul gives us a very clear answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he says that possession of the Holy Spirit is always shown by acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord and then a willingness to serve the world. Not just some, but all people. Without these gifts, Paul says, we're just tooting our own horns. And finally, Jesus says, and I like this part the best, he says, have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Wow, great words. Tough to do, isn't it? Be at peace with one another. What does he mean by this combination of salt and peace? I think that he is urging us to concentrate on our own discipleship and practically speaking, to examine our own sin first. And so this is not to ignore those who may be represent, misrepresenting the gospel, but rather it means to be willing, as he would say, to suffer and resist the world. And the key, Jesus says, is always to keep seeking to maintain peace among yourselves. Work at loving one another. Work at not saying harmful things about someone else. Work at lifting up and affirming the good intentions and efforts of others. Do everything you can to be the body of Christ in the world. In the midst of our deeply pluralistic culture, then, we find ourselves daily inundated with all these opportunities, I think, to be both threatened and to become prejudiced in our beliefs. And yet, as Jesus says, we are called here to have salt. Our first priority is to be at peace with one another. 
I have to be honest with you, I doubt that I will ever feel comfortable with the Warrens and other hardcore fundamentalists of this world. But I have to remember, just like we all do, they too are part of God's kingdom. And so while we strive to live together and embrace each other for who we are, the ultimate judgment belongs to God alone. In the meantime, I think we could all use a little more salt in our diet. Can I have an amen? Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. I told Dixie before the service I needed one good amen, so I got it from all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the salt and the seasoning that, again, you provide. Because the diets of our lives are filled with all kinds of of questionable things. Lord, you provide the seasoning that provides a worthy taste to life, our interactions with the one another. Lord, help us to spread, spread the salt of your, your grace liberally over our lives. And give us a sense again today of your work in the world that we too may be about grace and love, forgiveness and peace. Grant us this awareness and this agenda 